The castles of Britain, grand and beautiful, majestic and imposing. Some have been maintained throughout the centuries, but others have been forgotten, left to decay into history by ages past. But why were they built? Who were the men and women that built them? What events took place within and around their walls? And what stories can these age structures tell us today? Join me as I take a brief dive into the history of the castles of Britain. Today we take a brief dive into the history of White Castle in Monmouthshire, Wales. White Castle lies in an area of Wales historically known as the Welsh Marches or the Welsh Marchland, which is in southeast modern-day Wales. This area being called the Marches was essentially another way of saying that they were near the border of England and Wales. After William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066 and took over the country after defeating Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings, the Normans set about controlling the population of their newly conquered land. Part of this process included constructing castles across the landscape as power bases to enforce their rule, and this is where White Castle's origins begin. After overrunning the land that would eventually hold White Castle, it is believed that the Normans constructed three castles in relative close proximity to one another in what would eventually become Monmouthshire, Wales. These castles included Grossmont Castle, Skenfrith Castle, and of course White Castle, which was initially called Lantilio Castle due to its proximity to the modern-day village of Lantilio Crossini. Although there were other castles that would be built relatively close, such as the ones in Monmouth or Abergavenny, the three castles of Grossmont, Skenfrith, and White would all eventually be grouped together throughout the centuries and eventually colloquially be referred to as, surprise surprise, the three castles. To give perspective, White Castle, the furthest southwest of the three castles, is about 5 miles or 8 kilometers from Grossmont, which is to the north-northeast, and about 5.25 miles or 8.45 kilometers from Skenfrith, which lies to the east-northeast. The Hengwert moated site is about a mile and a half southeast of White Castle. It is unclear exactly when the three castles were built, but it is believed that they could have initially been built by William Fitz Osborne, the Earl of Hereford, during the time of William the Conqueror, but these structures would have been made of wood at that time. The three castles would not have been grouped together at this point into a separate lordship, but would still all have been under the control of Fitz Osborne as Earl of Hereford. After Fitz Osborne died, his second son Roger inherited his estates, but rebelled against William the Conqueror in 1075 in the so-called Revolt of the Earls, which caused the Conqueror to seize all of Roger's estates, which would of course include the three castles. With the crown now controlling that area, the castles and or estates began to be given away piecemeal during the reigns of William Rufus, aka William II, and Henry I. In the case of White Castle, this was most likely awarded to a man named Payne Fitzjohn, a royal official of Henry I, and one of Henry's so-called new men, which essentially meant that Fitzjohn was a lower-born individual that was raised through the ranks by the king because the king knew that these new men would show stronger loyalty. In 1135, the year of Henry I's death, the Welsh rose in revolt, which caused the then new king, Stephen, to exchange lands for control of White Castle, along with Grossmont and Skenfrith. It was at this time that the three castles came into being as an official lordship known as the three castles discussed previously. A royal official named Ralph of Grossmont, during the reign of Henry II, began to make improvements during this time, which included the beginning of transitioning the castles from wood to stone. By the beginning of the 13th century, 1201 to be precise, the, at the time, new king, John, granted the three castles to a man named Hubert de Burr. Hubert de Burr played an important part in the English monarchy during his time, as he played key roles in the reigns of King John and Henry III. He would fall in and out of favor with King John, 
eventually become Chief Justiciar of England, played a large role in controlling Henry III during Henry's regency, and was famously involved in guarding King John's captured nephew, Arthur, who would eventually disappear under suspicious circumstances. The three castles were, for a time, granted to a man named William de Prouse after de Burr had been captured on the continent, but de Burr eventually was able to gain the three castles back during the reign of Henry III when he was vying for power. New castle technology was being developed on the continent, and Hubert de Burr, who had experienced new castle designs when on the continent, began to utilize this new technology to update the three castles substantially. However, most of de Burr's updates were believed to be geared towards Grossmont and Skenfrith, while White Castle was not said to have been updated until a later date. By this time, White Castle had a square stone keep and a stone curtain wall, but it was most likely used as a military garrison and storage castle at this time, and was not a place thought to have housed a high-status individual, nor would it ever. Although White would become perhaps the most imposing of the three castles, it always lacked substantial living quarters for the high-status individuals, something that Grossmont and Skenfrith would have. This is why it has been concluded that White Castle may have been more of a military garrison than anything else. It should also be noted that White Castle actually began to be referred to as White Castle instead of Lentilio Castle in the 13th century, which was due to the white rendering that was applied to the walls. De Burr again lost his castles for a time when he fell out of favor with Henry III, at which point the castles were controlled for the king by a man named Walrund Teutonicus. De Burr regained the castles for a short time before falling out of favor again and dying. Walrund was again given charge of the castles, but by 1254, the three castles were given to Henry III's eldest son, Edward, the future Edward I, often referred to as Longshanks or the Hammer of the Scots. Edward is famous for his castle building in Wales, and it would be under his watch that White Castle would be substantially updated, which will be discussed shortly in the construction and layout section of this episode. In White Castle's case, the most serious updates to the castle came as a result of Llewellyn Ap Griffith's rebellion in 1260, which brought the three castles to the edge of hostile territory after Llewellyn's gains were recognized in 1267. Again, what was done during this time will be discussed in the construction and layout section of this video. In 1267, the castle was granted to Henry III's younger son, the younger brother of Edward I, known as Edmund Crouchback, who was the Earl of Lancaster. The three castles would remain in Lancastrian hands, or within the Duchy of Lancaster, until 1825, which, if counting, is 558 years. However, it was here in the late 13th century that the beginning of the end began for the three castles. Edward I became king in 1272 after Henry III's death, and he ultimately defeated Llewellyn Up Griffith, killing him and conquering Wales as a whole along the way. This largely meant that the three castles were no longer as important militarily or strategically, although they would continue to be centers of administration for some time. The castles transitioned from Edmund Crouchback after his death in 1296 to his son Thomas of Lancaster, who was involved in the opposition to the new, detested king at the time, Edward II. Thomas was executed for treason, and his lands, including the three castles, transitioned to the crown under Edward II. However, by the time Edward III came to the throne in 1327, the executed Thomas of Lancaster's younger brother Henry had come back into favor, and thus Henry was reinstated as the Earl of Lancaster by the new king, which put the three castles back into Lancastrian possession away from the crown. After Henry, who was the third Earl of Lancaster, died, his eldest son, the famous Henry of Grossmont, who played a large role in the reign of Edward III, the Hundred Years' War, and the beginning of the Order of the Garter, became the Earl of Lancaster and thus the owner of the three castles. Henry of Grossmont, who was by then the Duke of Lancaster, had no sons, but one of his daughters, Blanche of Lancaster, married Edward III's famous third son, a man named John of Gaunt. After the death of Blanche's sister Maud, the three castles came into the possession of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. John of Gaunt and Blanche were, of course, the parents of King Henry IV, also known as Henry Bolingbroke. After Edward III died, his grandson Richard, son of the Black Prince, became Richard II and attempted to disinherit his first cousin, Henry, the future Henry IV, after his father, John of Gaunt, died. But Henry was able to mount a successful bid for the throne from exile on the continent to depose and eventually execute Richard in order to become King Henry IV. 
After this, the three castles once again became royal assets, due to the crown belonging to the House of Lancaster after Henry IV took over the throne. Still, the castles remained as economic centers, but continued to see no military use. That is, with the exception of the rebellion of Owain Glendwer in the early 15th century, but the end of the Glendwer Rebellion between 1415 and 1421 was the last active military service for the Three Castles. As the Wars of the Roses came and went, and the Tudor dynasty came to be, the castles were said to have fallen into disrepair and largely abandoned by 1538 during the reign of Henry VIII. The three castles remained in Lancastrian hands until 1825 when they were sold to Henry Somerset, 6th Duke of Beaufort. By 1902, the Beaufort estate broke up the three castles and sold White Castle to a local landowner before it fell into state care in 1922. White Castle is currently maintained by Cadu Welsh Historic Monuments. Let us now take a closer look at the construction and layout of White Castle. White Castle consists of three main areas of earthwork, all of which were enclosed separately at one point and are surrounded by wet moats and dry ditches. The first earthwork area is south of the castle's inner ward itself and is a large crescent-shaped piece of ground known as hornwork, which is surrounded by a wet moat. When original wooden structures were built, and even through the time that the stone keep and curtain walls of the inner ward were built as well, the approach to the castle would have been from the south. The hornwork would have acted as a defensive barrier to the original Norman castle entrance and would have had a defensive wall surrounding it itself. Again, initially of wood, but there are remains of stone defenses, which most likely included a gatehouse to the southeast, which would have been accessed by a bridge, and a round tower at the northeast. The hornwork would have been connected by a wooden bridge, but there remains a stone wall connecting the hornwork to the inner ward, which was one of the two dams used in the moat. Looking at this artist's recreation of White Castle, we can see what the hornwork might have looked like in the 13th century. The second earthwork area is the inner ward, which is pear-shaped and surrounded by a wet moat. The inner ward consists of a two-towered four-story gatehouse to the northwest, which replaced the southern entrance to the castle sometime in the 13th century, a stone curtain wall which has four towers, two D-shaped and two circular, and the remains of many internal structures which is thought to include a hall, a well, apartment rooms, a chapel, a brew house, and a kitchen. The third earthwork area is the outer ward, which is north-northwest of the inner ward, surrounded by a dry ditch. It consists of a stone two-towered gatehouse, a stone curtain wall and four stone towers, three round and one square, along with the remains of some foundations within the ward that reflect that a large building, most likely a barn, was constructed somewhere near the northwest part of the ward. To the east of the gatehouse of the outer ward, lies additional ground that was once included in the outer ward prior to the stone structures being built. Looking once again at the artist's recreation of White Castle in the 13th century, we can see the inner ward with its internal buildings, the inner ward gatehouse with a bridge crossing the moat, and the outer ward with a large aisled barn, a gatehouse, and four towers, three round and one square. As far as timing for construction, the earliest structures that we see today would be parts of the curtain wall of the inner ward and the remains of the Norman keep. In the 12th century between 1177 and 1188, during the reign of Henry II, the three castles began the process of being morphed from wooden structures into stone ones, most likely beginning with the construction of a stone keep, which was near the original southern entrance to the castle. This, as we remember, had been done by a royal official named Ralph of Grossmont. In the early 13th century, which would be the 1200s, during the reign of King John, Hubert de Burr took over the castle, but as we remember, he focused much of his energy on the neighboring Grossmont and Skenforth castles, and thus, little to nothing was completed by de Burr at White Castle. After de Burr lost the castles for good, Walleran Teutonicus was given charge of the castles, and a new hall, a buttery, and a pantry was built during the reign of Henry III. Henry's son, Edward I, before becoming king, began work in 1256 to 1257 on a portcullis, an outer bridge, and new building works. The Norman keep is believed to have still stood at this time, but soon after this, Llewellyn ap Griffith's rising and subsequent conquest took place, 
which put White Castle on the edge of hostile territory. Thus, serious work began on White Castle, which included major design changes. The entrance was moved to the north, the stone keep was demolished, a new twin tower gatehouse was built on the northern edge of the inner ward, and four towers, two D-shaped and two circular, were added to the older 12th century curtain wall. The old entrance to the south and the now demolished Norman keep was replaced by a postern gate and a battery of arrow slits. Some of the inner buildings were also built during the 13th century, although not all, as some were added later. The current outer ward was also begun during the reign of Edward I, which included putting up a gatehouse and a stone curtain wall with round and one square towers. Part of the eastern tower of the inner gatehouse was rebuilt, perhaps after a collapse, most likely during one of the Lancastrian king's reigns, Henry IV, Henry V, or Henry VI. The last recorded update to White Castle was done during the reign of Henry VI, in which new floors and roofs were put onto the chapel tower and gatehouse. With that being said, let's take a closer look at some of the features of White Castle that can still be seen today. We will not be getting into every feature and detail that can still be seen at White Castle today, but we will be touching on a few things that can give an overview on what to look for if you travel here. We begin at the gatehouse of the outer ward, where we can still see the deep, dry ditch to the right, as well as the outer wall, which is seriously deteriorated on the east side of the outer ward near the gatehouse. As one moves closer, you can see that there is a stone base that would have held a static bridge, and a drawbridge would have met this stone foundation and static bridge about halfway across the dry ditch. The inner ward gatehouse and curtain wall can be seen to the left, which we will get to shortly. The outer gatehouse still has the grooves for the portcullis and would have had a pit underneath the drawbridge itself. There would have been two doors, one near the portcullis side and one near the outer ward side, with an inner chamber between the two that would have had a vaulted ceiling. The gatehouse would have had an inner guard chamber and an upper floor in which the drawbridge could be operated. Moving to the north of the outer ward, standing outside the castle in the dry ditch, we can see the square tower of the outer curtain wall and one of the three round towers of the outer curtain wall as well. The outer curtain wall and outer tower shown here, along with the gatehouse we just discussed, would have been 13th century additions sometime around the back end of Henry III's reign or early part of Edward I's reign. There would have been a battlemented wall walk that would have connected the towers but the square tower would have been used to house the official there, as it has a fireplace and a latrine, but the three round towers would have been more military in function. The three round towers are almost all identical, and the towers would have been accessed by a wooden stair up to the second floor, first floor if you're from Britain, from within the outer ward. The bottom floors of these towers would have been unlit and probably accessed by the floor above. The outer ward towers can give us a first glimpse at White Castle's arrow slits, which are odd due to their design. At White Castle, for some reason, the arrow slits crossbars were offset, something that was not seen elsewhere. It has been surmised that this could give more angles to shoot at enemies on the outside of the castle, as the countryside outside of the castle is hilly, but the true reason can never truly be known. Moving into the outer ward, facing the inner ward, we can see the water moat separating the inner and outer wards. The northeast tower is the tower that was rebuilt sometime, probably after a collapse, and the put log holes, which were used essentially for scaffolding, can be seen in this rebuilt tower. This also gives us a good look at the curtain wall of the inner ward, which is one of the oldest parts of the castle dating to the 12th century, aka the 1100s. An older image from a similar vantage point taken in the 1970s reflects the remains of the pit below, which gives an estimate on how far the drawbridge would have extended from the gatehouse. As we move a little bit further west within the outer ward, still looking towards the inner ward, we can see one of the four towers that were added along with the gatehouse in the 13th century. This would have most likely had wooden hoardings to cap the towers and the wall walks, although the gatehouse would not have had hoardings. As we move to the bridge to cross into the inner ward, we see the imposing gatehouse from a straight on view. As we remember, this gatehouse along with the four inner ward towers, one of which we just viewed, 
would have been constructed in the 13th century when the outer ward was begun as well. Again, this would have been at the back end of Henry III's reign or the front end of Edward I's reign. These are four-story towers, which would have been accessed from the inner ward side, which we will see in a moment. However, the left tower does have access from the gatehouse passage. There would have been a portcullis here, and the portcullis would have been operated by a crew housed in a wooden room above the drawbridge between the two towers. The two gatehouse towers are four stories, which would have been accessed by a spiral staircase, with the exception of the third floor, second floor if you're British, which would have been unlit and probably accessed by a trapdoor. As we move into the outer ward, we can turn around and see the back side of the gatehouse, along with the entrances to the gatehouse towers from the rear. The west tower can still be climbed to this day. The remains of the hall can be seen in the lower part of this image, which shows two separate phases. The hall has a square hearth, and the foundations seen would have been sleeper walls, meaning that they were shorter with wooden walls stacked on top of the sleeper walls. Moving up the gatehouse stairs and viewing the inner ward from the gatehouse, looking to the left we can see the wall walk and the hall foundations once again. The well and the east tower we will get to shortly, but they can also be seen in this photo. We can see here that the hall had two phases. The older hall would have been the larger outer L-shaped foundation, whereas the more recent hall, dating probably from the 13th century around 1244, would have been the smaller inner L-shaped foundation. Turning to the right, we can see the remains of the domestic apartments on the east side, followed by a corner room with a latrine pit. Next to this is the chapel foundations, which would have been a wooden structure that would have extended out from the D-shaped tower behind it, this tower being referred to as the chapel tower. The chancel and altar of the chapel itself would have been housed in the actual tower and would have been lit by arrow loops. Next to the chapel tower, we see the foundations of the Norman-style keep, which is, along with the curtain wall, one of the oldest structures at White Castle, dating to the 12th century. Only half of the Norman Keep foundation can be seen, as when it was demolished in the 13th century, the existing South Curtain Wall was built over it and essentially cut the old Norman Keep in two. We can see the battery of arrow loops that were installed when this new wall was put up, along with the postern gate. We remember that this would have been the original entrance to the castle in Norman times. Moving past the second D-shaped tower, we come to the brew house and kitchens. Taking a closer look at the brew house, we can see two ovens or kilns, which is near the entrance of one of the round towers that we viewed from the exterior. The square kiln would have been a malting kiln where barley was roasted and the square kiln would have been where the barley was ground and boiled with other ingredients. Opposite the brew house, between the hall and the domestic apartments would have been the well, which is right outside the entrance to one of the round towers. This tower, along with the tower opposite of it, was cut into the 12th century wall when installed in the 13th century. The two upper floors are unlit, and the basement would have, again, most likely been accessed by a trap door. Moving through the postern gate and crossing over the hornwork and turning around, we can see what the rear of White Castle looks like today. Again, there are stone remains on the hornwork, but little is visible today with the exception of the wall that was used as a dam. As we return to the top of the gatehouse and look out towards the outer ward, we can catch a glimpse of the surrounding landscape and why White Castle is located where it is. If you are interested in visiting White Castle, you can find more information on Cadu's website, link in the description. Okay, well that has been a brief look at White Castle in Monmouthshire Wells. This is Brief History signing off. Thank you for watching and I will catch you on the next one. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.